It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. It's, it's my great pleasure to introduce to, to you now somebody I've never actually met until today, but uh, we're very pleased to have him along, a distinguished academic from the great team at uh, Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst, uh, with which several of us have long-standing connections. Uh, Dr. Peter Lieb um, is a specialist, I think, in the German uh, Army's occupation policy in the two world wars. He uh, got his doctorate from the Institute of Contemporary History in Munich, and uh, he also uh, is a prize winner, like uh, Bob Foley. Um, he won the Werner Halbeck Prize in uh, 2006, or around uh, or a long time ago, 10 years ago anyway. Uh, so um, he, he's uh, going to sp be speaking to us this morning on the German army in, in the East, which is something which we in the Western Front Association probably don't pay enough attention to. I think if Peter's inspiring enough, we might give rise to a, an Eastern Front Association, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you. Peter Leap. Thanks a lot for the kind words. Thanks a lot for the applause. I don't know whether it's already deserved for me. Um, Right, um, I will speak about the Eastern Front. Robert has already um, partly referred to the Eastern Front uh, in his presentation on the Western Front. I will return the favor and also partly refer again to the Western Front, my topic, on, my presentation on the Eastern Front, so that shows how interconnected both theaters of war were. And also, as a symbol, how well uh, Robert's and mine, my presentation are synchronized, you can see. By accident or by coincidence, we use both the same PowerPoint uh, template. <laughs> well done. OK. Good. In Imperial Germany, there was a popular saying during the First World War. Im Westen kämpft ein stolzes Heer, im Osten tut's die Feuerwehr. Don't get confused. This presentation won't be in German. <laughs> it translates into a proud army is fighting in the West. The, in the East, the fire brigade will do the job. This meant that for Germany, the Western Front was the main theater of war, whilst the Eastern Front was mostly seen as a secondary theater. The perceived low strategic importance of the Eastern Front in the First World War is mirrored today by the amount of historical research on this theater of war. A few years ago, the Military History Research Institute of the German Armed Forces in Potsdam published an edited volume on the Eastern Front with a meaningful title the Forgotten Front. Even though some research has been done on the subject in the past years, our knowledge still remains rudimentary. Who has ever heard about the Battle of Lake Narach in March 1916? Who knows that the, that the Russian army deported around 1 million Jews and 250,000 ethnic Germans from its western borders into central Russia during the Great Retreat in the summer 1915? Who is aware that the Germans and the Austrians occupied a territory in the East in 1918, which was almost as big as the one the Nazis ruled some 25 years later? People interested in the First World War can probably mention a number of battles on the Eastern Front. Tannenberg and the Masurian Lakes in 1914, Golichitanov in 1915, even though I doubt whether everyone is aware that this was by far the largest breakthrough battle in the First World War, the Brusilov Offensive in 1916, and perhaps finally the Kerensky Offensive and Riga, the Battle of Riga in 1917. I apologize that you cannot expect new revolutionary insights into the Eastern Front from me today. 
I will not be able to shed some light on forgotten battles on this, of this front, but as my paper clearly indicates, I will focus on the opening battles on the Eastern Front in 1914 instead. Luckily for me, and perhaps unluckily for you, the Russian campaign in East Prussia with the battles of Tannenberg and the Masurian Lakes has probably been the most researched sub subject of all the battles and operations on the Eastern Front during the First World War. Hence, my presentation will be on the Battle of Tannenberg in August 1914, and I will try to answer the following questions. First, what was the strategic context of the Russian campaign in East Prussia in 1914? Second, what were the key events in the Battle of Tannenberg? Third, what were the reasons for the Russian failure and the German success? Fourth, what were the long-term consequences of the Battle of Tannenberg? Fifth, what was the extent of the Russian atrocities in East Prussia in summer 1914? All this is embedded into the overarching question whether Tannenberg was a decisive German victory. When the First World War broke out, the strategy of all three major powers was initially clear for Eastern Europe. The German Empire remained in the defensive and intended to fight a decisive battle in France first. In contrast, Austria and Russia massed their troops with an offensive intention. By doing so, these two armies mirrored the European trend. Offensive action was deemed key to success in all European general staffs. The role model were the Russian German armies, sorry, Prussian German armies from the last major European war, the Franco-Prussian War in 1870-71. The mantra of the decisive battle, or as Karl von Clausewitz called it, the Vernichtungsschlacht, the annihilation battle, dominated the military mindset. A quick decision on the battlefield was the creed of the time, particularly in the German Empire, which had to avoid an attritional war due to its geographical position in the center of Europe. Victory should be gained by a Vernichtungsschlacht. The enemy be denuded of his military capacity. It must be stressed that this was exclusively about the physical and or psychological annihilation of the enemy's armed forces. Then, annihilation referred solely to purely military matters and did not include the annihilation of the enemy population, as some historians have wrongly suggested. The prototype of the annihilation battle was the so-called Kesselschlacht, which translates into cauldron battle. I will, however, in this presentation, rather use the term encirclement battle. The own troops enveloped the enemy quick, by quick maneuvers and finally encircled him from all sides. Cut off from his supply routes and furthermore being in a psychologically difficult position, it was hoped that the enemy would quickly surrender. For the first time in history, this principle was applied in the Battle of Cannae in 216 before Christ, when the Carthaginian commander Hannibal annihilated a Roman army much stronger in numbers. The encirclement battle seemed to be a tempting concept for numer numerically inferior forces, and hence this thinking was pivotal, particularly in the German military before 1914. Tellingly, the chief of the general staff between 1891 and 1906 the famous Count Alfred von Schlieffen, wrote his own book on Cannae, and consequently, it did not come as a surprise that his own operational plan against France, the so-called Schlieffen plan, was planned as a gigantic super Cannae, as the, quote, most fantastic Kesselschlacht of all times, end of quote, as the historian Robert Cetino called it. Seven armies with nearly 1.5 million men should bring about a quick decision against France before the German Empire could throw its forces into the east against Russia. In the meantime, the front there had to be held by a single army, 8th Army, with a bit more than 150,000 men. The German strategy implied that the Austro-Hungarian ally would bear the brunt of the fighting in the east during the first weeks of the general war. However, the cooperation between both central powers had its shortcomings. For decades, both chiefs of the general staff had met in order to synchronize their intents. But these talks did not result in a common operational plan, let alone in a common supreme command against the Russian enemy. 
There were only vague agreements that the German Empire should fix as many Russian forces as possible in East Prussia. The Austro-Hungarian chief of the general staff, Franz Konrad von Hötzendorf, always expressed his wishes of a German offensive into Russian Poland, but the German general staff did not consider such a plan. The principle of mutual hope finally prevailed. The German Empire hoped Austro-Hungary could ward off a Russian offensive as long as possible, and Austro-Hungary hoped that the German Empire could defeat France as quickly as possible in order to, to deploy subsequently troops into the East. The repercussions of the Schlieffen Plan determined the initial strategies of the Central Powers on the Eastern Front. The Russian operational plans were unclear too. In May 1912, the plan number 19 was changed so that two offensives should be launched simultaneously. One into East Prussia against Germany and one into Galicia against Austro-Hungary. These plans mirrored Russian foreign policy. By starting an offensive against the German Empire, the Russians believed to meet the, their treaty commitments with France. By attacking Austro-Hungary, they pursued their own policy on the Balkans, where Austro-Hungary was seen as the main enemy. This indecision and the consequent split of forces were the root of the Russian military failures in 1914, at least in East Prussia. These problems became even more aggravated when after French diplomatic pressure, the Russians raised another two armies in the area around Warsaw shortly after the outbreak of the war. These two new armies were supposed to march towards Berlin. Although this offensive plan was finally dropped due to the unforeseen events in East Prussia, it meant that additional troops had been taken away from the actual operations in East Prussia and Galicia. The result was a split of forces. 29 and a half divisions were deployed against the German Empire in East Prussia, and 46 and a half divisions, i.e. more, 50% more divisions, were deployed against Austro-Hungary in Galicia. For these operations, the Russians had even introduced a new command level. They formed, two, they formed two army groups, the Northwest Front for East Prussia and the Southwest Front for Galicia. With these two army groups, the Russians had in theory the right command level to coordinate the simultaneous operations in East Prussia and Galicia. But the Russians lacked the skills to make the best use out of their army groups. Both operated completely independent from each other against both central powers. This lack of coordination was also reflected in the operations in East Prussia itself. The commander of the Northwest Front, General Yakov Zelensky, was unable to coordinate his two armies. The Russian operational plan for East Prussia was based on a pincer movement. It resulted from the geographical constraints with the Masurian lakes and did not offer much, co much scope for surprise. Russian First Army, under General Paul von Rennenkampf, a Baltic German, attacked from the east, and Russian Second Army, under General Alexander Samsonov, attacked from the south. With the Masurian lakes between them, each army had to conduct its operations independently about 90 kilometers apart. So, for the Brits, yeah, 90 kilometers, uh, 50, 60 miles. Mutual support was hence excluded. This was worsened by the fact that Rennenkampf and Samsonov hated each other and belonged to two rivalry groups within the Russian army. Rennenkampf, the tradi traditionalist, and Samsonov, the re reformer or modernizer. Against all expectations, the Russians were able to mobilize the army much quicker than it had been previously thought. Instead of the six, six to eight weeks the Germans had calculated with, it took the Russians only a bit more than two weeks. This was largely due to the deployment of the Russian army. 40% of it, i.e. all the forces earmarked for the East Prussia and Galicia campaigns, had been deployed near the border already in peacetime. The Russians did not want to wait for the mobilization of the whole army. 
but rather launched their opening offensive immediately. It is unclear whether this decision was linked to the ideological belief in offensive spirit. Probably the premature start of the offensive had purely pragmatic reasons. First, the Russians felt superior to the Austro-Hungarians anyway. And second, they wanted to weaken the Germans before those could deploy new troops from France into the east. Regardless of the deeper reasons, the Russians saw the Vernichtungsschlacht as a, receipt, as a recipe for success, just as the enemies did. So all major powers in the East believed in the concept of a Vernichtungsschlacht, of an annihilation battle. Already on 15th of August, the two armies of the Northwest Front started their operations against East Prussia. Just under 400,000 Russians were facing only a bit more than 100, 150,000 Germans. The Russians had therefore a numerical superiority of 2.5 to 1. These numbers, the swift mobilization and the early start of the campaign seemed impressive at a glance. But at the same time, they hit a number of shortcomings. When comparing the artillery, the numer numerical superiority of the Northwest Front was put into perspective. Into perspective. Here, the Germans achieved more or less parity. In the heavy artillery, they even enjoyed an advantage. Furthermore, the Russians were short of supply with artillery ammunition. The railway system was not as powerful as it had been hoped for, despite all these improvements with French money prior to 1914. Only eight railway, railway lines led to the western border, of which only five were double-tracked. The transport of a single army corps took several days for the Russians on these railway lines. On 17th and 20th August, the Germans and the Russians clashed for the first time at Stalupönen and Gubinnen. These are two little towns, which would be somewhere here. The Germans were unable to stop the advance of Rennenkampf's first army. And the German commander of 8th Army, Maximilian von Prittwitz, even considered a retreat behind the Vistula. The chief of the general staff, Helmut von Moltke, reacted, the chief of the German general staff, so the OHL, Helmut von Moltke reacted and relieved the unlucky Prittwitz of his post. In the interwar years, it was fervently debated whether the events really justified this change of personnel. In any case, two men arrived in the East who did not have only fundamental impact upon the operations in East Prussia, but also beyond on the entire First World War and even on German politics after 1918. Paul von Hindenburg became new commander of 8th Army, Erich Ludendorff his chief of staff. Hindenburg characterized in his memoirs the pro professional relationship between both as, quote, a happy marriage before both estranged later in the 1920s. When Hindenburg and Ludendorff arrived in the East, the staff of 8th Army had probably already completed the operational order. Hitherto, the majority of the German 8th Army had been fighting against Russian 1st Army. But meanwhile, it had become clear that the greater danger was looming from the south. A quick advance of the Russian 2nd Army could cut off all German lines of retreat from East Prussia. The German main effort consequently swapped from the Russian 1st Army to the 2nd Army. Three German army corps were withdrawn from the front of 1st Army and sent southwards in order to face the 2nd Army. The movement by railway of the 1st Army Corps from the far left to the far right wing of the 8th Army seemed to be particularly bold. So that's this movement here. Against Russian 1st Ar Army remained only a single cavalry division, two Landwehr brigades and several units from the Königsberg garrison. In total, only about, about 30,000 Germans were facing almost 200,000 Russians of Renenkamp's army. The Germans took a big risk, but their deception succeeded. 
the Russians did not notice the shift of the German main effort. Consequently, Rennenkampf's army continued to advance only very slowly westwards towards Königsberg, and Samsonov's army continued its march northwards and hence into perdition. The Germans enveloped the enemy, enemy flanks with one corps each and finally encircled the Russian second army. The double disobedience of one of the uh, corps commanders, uh, Hermann von Francois, unintentionally favored this maneuver. First, against Ludendorff's explicit order, he waited for two days with his attack until his artillery had completely reached the battlefield. And second, von Francois ignored later Ludendorff's halt order and kept up the momentum which finally led to the complete encirclement of the enemy. Within only two days, the Russian Second Army collapsed. Samsonov committed suicide on 30 of August. The battle was finished. The Russian casualties are not fully clear, but of the initial 200,000 men, a mere 20,000 could escape to the Russian border. Ludendorff now launched his victorious forces against the Russian First Army. Until mid-September, the German Eighth Army was able to expel the Russians from East Prussia in the successive Battle of the Masurian Lakes. Rennenkampf's First Army, however, did not share the fate of Samsonov's Second Army and was able to escape from annihilation. East Prussia was now liberated. The Russians had lost about 250,000 men, the Germans only 37,000. In the Masurian Lakes battle, the Germans deployed two additional army corps which had been withdrawn from, from the Marne battle at the, peak, at the peak of the Marne battle. This decision was a topic of a heated debate in the interwar years. Until today, nobody has seriously studied whether the lack of these two army corps had an impact on the outcome of the Marne battle. If yes, then it could be argued that the Germans won in East Prussia at the expense of a defeat at the Marne. Regardless of this hypothetical question, one fact remains. Tannenberg was a stunning German victory. What were the reasons behind this success? Many of these reasons have deeper roots and go back to the pre-war years in both armed forces. Perhaps we should start with an analysis of the Russian losers. Much has been written, uh, written why Renningkampf neither supported Samsonov nor advanced quickly towards Königsberg. It has been argued that the strained relationship between both generals was responsible for this, something Clausewitz would have called friction. But was it actually possibly possible for Renningkampf to quickly support Samsonov? A glance on the map and the terrain make this claim doubtful, as between both armies lay the Masurian lakes. It is conspicuous that the Russian general staff, the Stavka, Stavka, did not immediately blame Renningkamp for the failure of the East Prussia campaign. He kept his command even after the defeat at the Masurian lakes and was only relieved after the Battle of Lodz in early December 1914. In contrast, the commander of the Northwest Front, Chilinski, had to go immediately after Tannenberg. This was a fair decision because he, and not Renningkampf, would have, had been, resp would have been responsible for coordinating the advance of both armies. Actually, the Russians wanted to force a quick annihilation battle, based on their understanding of German doctrine and particularly their own experiences from the war against Japan in 1904-1905. Russian doctrine from 1912 stressed, 1912 stressed that, quote, offensive actions are the best means to achieve the objective, end of quote. But in the East Prussia campaign, both Russian armies did not put this principle into, act, into practice. Neither Renenkampf nor Samsonov operated with firm determination. Everything happened slowly and confirmed the image of the sluggish Russian steamroller. Ten days after the start of the campaign, Renenkampf's army had only advanced a bit more than 100 kilometers, again for Brits, 60 miles about, into East Prussia, Samsonov even only 50 miles. 
although both had not met any serious German opposition until then. Both armies suffered from su supply problems and had only incomplete intelligence about the German enemy. An important point here was the Russian trust into their cavalry. At the start of the campaign, both armies of the Northwest Front numbered 26 divisions, of which seven, i.e. more than a quarter, were cavalry divisions. Renenkampf's and Samsonov's orders from 13 August emphasized once more the importance of the cavalry for the coming operations in East Prussia. They were supposed to form the advance party and furthermore destroy key parts of the enemy's infrastructure in the hinterland, particularly train stations, in order to render a German retreat impossible on the railway lines. The Russians also used their cavalry extensively for reconnaissance missions and even hoped to fight a traditional cavalry battle. The cavalry was seen as a means to keep the operations mobile. The big disadvantage of the cavalry was, however, their need of huge quantities of supply to feed the horses. We heard this also in, earlier in Robert's um, presentation. This put an additional strain on the already overstretched Russian supply system in the East Prussia campaign. It was paradoxical. Whilst on a tactical level, the use of the cavalry enabled mobility on the battlefield, the logistical demands of the cavalry prevented a war of maneuver on the operational level. In sum, the overemphasis over of the cavalry was one of the main reasons for the slow Russian advance in August 1914. The Russian army literally backed the wrong horse. Russian doctrine of seeking a quick and decisive battle very soon collided with reality in August 1914. The Russian army was not prepared for a quick war. Even though the mobilization of the first troops was achieved much faster than it had been thought, the general mobilization of the army proceeded quite slowly. As a consequence, Russia was able to fight only a war of attrition in which not speed, but the sheer mass of troops brought about the decision. The split of their forces against Germany on the one hand and Austria on the other hand contributed further to the fact that Russia could not achieve a decisive victory despite some astonishing successes in Galicia in 1914. The logistical overstretch did not allow the Russians to transform their tactical and even operational feats into a strategic success. In, sh in short, theory and practice did not match in the Tsarist army. Norman Stone, the historian Norman Stone, concluded aptly about the Russian disaster in East Prussia, I quote, the Tsarist army was not crippled by its inferiority in artillery or men, it was crippled by its inability to use its superiority, end of quote. Battles are, however, never decided solely by weaknesses and shortcomings of the defeated side. So how about the German victors? They were able to exploit the undeniable weaknesses of the Russian army because of their sup superior operational thinking. I know there's a quite a bit of debate going on here about this type of subject, but uh, in war you don't have to be perfect, you just have to be better than the other side. This said, the Germans had not had not had a fixed operational plan for a Russian invasion of East Prussia. Various options had been considered before 1914, but in reality, the local commanders should receive freedom of action. The concept of leading by mission, or sometimes also called mission command, was crucial. Orders could be executed much quicker on the battlefield, which enabled the Germans to preempt their Russian enemies. It was not an exception in the German armed forces that subordinates, subordinates acted against the intent of their sen senior commanders. Francois' disobedience against Ludendorff's orders was a classical example in the Tannenberg battle. However, if successful, this was not treated as insubordination. German officers were allowed to try something on their own initiative and even make mistakes. There was only one thing German doctrine did not forgive, passivity, passivity, so inaction. Another two factors contributed to the success of German operational thinking. 
First, the Russians had introduced radio on their senior command levels, but they lacked trained personnel so that all radio messages were transmitted decoded and the Germans eavesdropped. They were hence always kept in the picture about the Russian intents. Second, the Russians relied solely on the cavalry for intelligence, whilst the Germans used aircraft so that they always had an eye on the enemy. Their superior means of communication and intelligence gave the Germans the upper hand and thanks to the concept of mission command, they could quickly exploit this informational advantage on the battlefield. The Germans were always at least one step ahead. They were able to outthink and consequently outfight the Russians. This explains the slow Russian advance on the one hand and the quick German reaction to the threat from Russian Second Army in the south on the other hand. Finally, the Germans enjoyed a perfect infrastructure in East Prussia. The movement of the 1st Army Corps from the left to the right flank of 8th Army took only four days by rail. But also on forced marches, marches the Germans performed impress impressively. For example, 17th Army Corps advanced 50 kilometers on a single day during its march to meet Russian 2nd Army. So 50 kilometers, 35 miles, 30 miles, 30 miles. The Germans were able to redeploy their troops much quicker than the Russians due to the shorter distances, the terrain and the infrastructure. The Swiss military theoretician Antoine-Henri Jomini, Clausewitz's intellectual counterpart in the 19th century, called this the interior lines. It was about, it was about the ability to concentrate by strategic maneuvers a larger mass of friendly forces faster at the most important point than the enemy could do. The Russians, in contrast, operated on the outer lines. Before Samsonov could re recognize and react to the new situation, his second army was already trapped without any hope of support from Renningham's first army. Therefore, the German eighth army was able to beat both Russian armies one after the next. Even though clearly outnumbered overall, the Germans managed to achieve numer numerical pa pa parity for both battles in the case of artillery, even a solid superiority. Tannenberg kept a special place in German memory after 1914, both militarily and politically. Ludendorff and Hindenburg were deemed the saviors of East Prussia. Already during the war, but especially after 1918, the battle held a mystic place in German public. This already started with a name. The town of Tannenberg was actually only in proximity of the battlefield. Here, the Teutonic Order had suffered a crushing defeat against the Polish-Lithuanian army in 1410. By renaming the Battle of 1914 into Battle of Tannenberg, the defeat of the Teutonic Order should fall into oblivion. Between 1924 and 1927, a huge monument was erected on the battlefield of 1914, in memory of the heroes of Tannenberg, Ludendorff and Hindenburg. This cult of personality played into Hindenburg's hands. President in the Weimar Republic since 1925, he could, he could cement his reputation and his legitimacy as head of state, even among the social democrats. At Tannenberg, he had not only achieved a sweeping military success, but also beaten an enemy which was deemed a cultural danger to German civilization. However, the extent of Hindenburg's personal contribution to the success, success at Tannenberg has remained a controversial subject until today. The same is true for his chief of staff, Ludendorff. Were both generals really the operational military geniuses? There was another battle of Tannenberg in the 1920s. This time, a battle about who was able to carry away the glory and memory of the victory. In their memoirs, both Hindenburg and Ludendorff presented themselves as the saviors of Russia, uh, saviors of East Prussia against the Russian steamroller. Particularly Hindenburg boasted about the military success and claimed the entire operational plan in East Prussia in 1914 was based on his own ideas. From the very start, 
The aim was not a simple victory, but the annihilation of Samsonov's army, Hindenburg wrote in his memoirs. But Hindenburg occasionally bent the truth. Ludendorff also boasted that Moltke could not have chosen a better man than himself to save East Prussia. Moltke, as Ludendorff claimed, had unconditional trust in him. He also declared that upon his arrival, he had rebuilt a depressed morale in the headquarters of Eighth Army. But at least Ludendorff also emphasized the performance of his staff and his subordinates. A key figure in the staff of Eighth Army was the first general staff officer, Max Hoffmann. Initially on best terms with Ludendorff's, but much less so with Hindenburg, all three men clashed over German policy in the East in 1918 and later over the question whose version about Tannenberg was the generally accepted one in German public. Hoffmann vehemently, vehemently opposed Hindenburg's and Ludendorff's claims that the two generals were the architects of the victory. Hoffmann wrote his own version in 1926 with a pro pragmatic title, Tannenberg, as it really happened. Hoffmann's version, was preva Hoffmann's version has prevailed in histori historiography today. He apparently analyzed the battle more moderately and more critically, even though he too emphasized his own contribution to the victory. According to him, the concrete plan against Samsonov's second army had already been elaborated before Hindenburg's and Ludendorff's arrival in the east. The corresponding orders had already been issued, the troops had started to execute them. Hoffmann asserted Tannenberg had not been planned as an encirclement battle from the beginning. It was only Rennenkampf's passivity that allowed the Germans to expose their left flank and launch the mass of their army against Samsonov's second army. Only by doing so, Tannenberg became a Kane battle. As almost all military documents concerning the Tannenberg battle were destroyed after a Royal Air Force air raid on Potsdam in spring 1945, the question must remain open whose story of the, of the events was the true one. The Linden hindenburg Ludendorff version or the Hoffmann version? One thing, however, is certain. Many German military analyzed the battle in the interwar years by recurring to racist stereotypes. One example is the work of Wolfgang von Stefani, a veteran of the battle. A veteran of the battle. In his book, The Secret of Tannenberg, Stefani wrote, I quote, fighting passionately for the liberation of his home country, accustomed to hardships and trained by strict discipline to self-sacrifice, the German soldier acted independently and defeated the Russian soldier who, brave but dull, obeyed only like a machine, end of quote. The Germans believed that their judgment about the Russian leadership before the war was fully confirmed. Slow, unimaginative, lethargic and without initiative. Indeed, Tannenberg did not prove, I quote, Russia's economic backwardness, backwardness. It merely proved that armies will lose battles if they are led badly enough, end of quote, as Norman Stone wrote. This assessment was, was largely right in 1914, but in the long run, it contributed to a dangerous underestimation of the Russian enemy not only in the future course of the First World War, but particularly in Operation Barbarossa in the Second World War. Tannenberg cast its long shadow before. There was another point which had a long-lasting impact on the remembrance of the Russian East, Russian East Prussia campaign in 1914. The Russian atrocities against the local German population a fact that soon traded under the term of Russenkreuel, which translates into Russian atrocities. During the short-lived occupation of August and September 1914, looting was widespread amongst Russian soldiers. Farmhouses and dwellings were burned down, civilians murdered. The Russian atrocities became, similar to the German atrocities in the West during the same period, soon an object of propaganda. In the eyes of many Germans, the image of the uncivilized Slavic aggressors was confirmed. Max Hoffmann, for example, believed there had never been and there would never be a war in future which had been fought with such brutal savagery. The Social Democrats, too, 
saw this as a proof of the oppressive Tsarist regime. Much has been talked about the Russian atrocities since 1914, but only very little has been published on the subject. Hitherto, some historians, such as Dennis Showalter, have exculpated these Russian atrocities. Others, such as John Horn and Alan Kramer, played down the dimensions, or some academics, such as the German Immanuel Geis, even denied their existence. In a forthcoming groundbreaking article, Alexander Watson will be the first historian to have ever thoroughly studied the Russian atrocities in the East Prussia in detail. Watson concludes that the dimensions of death and destruction reached the same level as the German atrocities in Belgium and Northern France around the same time, or even surpassed them. Watson largely confirms the findings of the German official history of the First World War, which was published in 20, 1925. The chapter about Russian atrocities was surprisingly objective, as the authors did not only write about the crimes, but also about acts of humanity from the Russian troops. The official history even concedes that there, that, quote, there were not as many atrocities committed by the Russians as they had been initially reported, end of quote. Yet, the Russians left a considerable trace of destruction. According to the German official history, the Russians burned down completely Domnau and Bartenstein, which were towns with several thousand inhabitants each. During the four weeks of Russian occupation in East Prussia, 1,620 civilians were killed, 433 wounded, and over 10,000 deported to Russia, about half of which were women and children. Two-thirds of the deported did not return home after the war. Furthermore, the Russians destroyed 34,000 buildings, i.e. more than the Germans destroyed in Belgium and northern France around the same time on a much, on a much vaster territory. It has to remain open to what extent the losses and the destruction were directly linked to combat. In contrast to the German atrocities in Belgium and northern France, we briefly discussed it in, after Robert's presentation, the Russian atrocities can only partly link to overreaction and nervousness of the troops upon their first encounter with the enemy. German reports in East Prussia agreed that the first Russian troops had displayed a correct behavior, and it were only the second echelon troops that pillaged and killed, with Cossacks being the worst offenders. The atrocities seem to have almost exclusively happened in the countryside, particularly if there were no officers present. In the towns, the cohabitation between Russian military and German civilians seems to have, seemed to have happened without major frictions. The Russian order to live off the land as far as possible certainly favored pillaging. Above all, however, the invader sensed treason and espionage everywhere and feared the population would take part in the combat. The exact motives for all these acts of violence must remain open as long as the Russian primary sources have not been consulted. A comparison with the Russian behavior in Galicia is of interest. There, the Russian military leaders initially strictly adhered to the Hague Convention in summer and autumn 1914, at least officially. For example, the Austria, Austrian laws remained in place and the civil service was not touched. However, the preconditions were completely different to East Prussia, as the Russian army believed that they would not enter enemy but friendly territory in multi-ethnic Galicia and hence considered themselves as liberators of the Slavic population from the Habsburg yoke. The invasion of the city of Lemberg happened without any incidents, despite preceding fear of the local population. In the countryside, however, some Cossack units pillaged civilians, especially Jews and Germans. Most brutal was certainly the behavior of the Austro-Hungarian army in Galicia during the first weeks of the war. Not only as an army of occupation against a foreign population, but against their own country fellows. The Austro-Hungarian military suspected their own Slavic population of being pro-Russian and sensed treason everywhere. Thousands of civilians were hung, another 30,000 interned in camps under the worst conditions. Even in the autumn of 1915, the high command of the Austro-Hungarian army summarized about Galicia, quote, 
The civil population is largely unreliable, end of quote. Albeit on a lower dimension, the German army was also guilty of some crimes during these weeks, especially in the Polish border town of Kalisz on Russian territory. Between the 2nd and the 22nd of August, German troops destroyed over 400 buildings and killed several hundred civilians. By the end of August, only 5,000 inhabitants out of the initially 65,000 were left in Kalisz. The rest had fled or was expulsed. It will not be possible anymore to clarify what exactly happened in this town, and the German motives will remain obscure, as all German military documents are lost, and the Polish, testimon Polish testimonies are partly contradictory. It is unclear whether friendly fire or Russian agent provocateur tricked the events. In other parts of Russian Poland, German troops are believed to have looted, even though the evidence has remained rather shallow for this claim. At least it seems that there were no other German massacres than Kalisz. The German military did not touch their own Polish population in West Prussia either. For the Germans, the Poles were not seen as a source of enemy espionage or even sabotage. Let me conclude. On the operational level, the Battle of Tannenberg in 1914 was a classic example of an encirclement battle in the sense of Kane. It I quote, corresponded with the classical ideal of an envelopment battle with annihilation character fought by numerically inferior forces, end of quote, as the German historian Gerhard Groß wrote. In France, the strategic Cannae failed with a Schlieffen plan. In the East, at least the operational Cannae succeeded at Tannenberg. Unsurprisingly, the battle was celebrated even after 1918 as the, quote, Kane of the World War. But Kane was not the norm and was to take a special status throughout the war. Quote, despite its limitations, it was the only non-attritional victory achieved in a major theater by any of the major combatants in World War I, end of quote, as Dennis Showalter concluded. And it was the only time in the war that the Germans could fight their preferred battle on the operational level this envelopment and encirclement battle. Tannenberg was certainly an impressive German victory. Let's leave aside the question whether it was really, quote, one of the most brilliant battles of, world, of the world history, end of quote, as Ludendorff claimed in his memoirs. What is certain, however, is the fact that Tannenberg was not a decisive battle in a Clausewitzian sense. The battle only brought operational advantages, but no strategic ones. A single decisive battle, or even a series of decisive battles, as the German general staff had envisaged before 1914, was no longer possible. Tannenberg was, was thus an anachronism. Clausewitz's concept of a strategic annihilation battle failed when it met the reality of an industrialized war. By mid-September, Russia had fully mobilized and called 5.3 million men to the colors. Given these figures, the almost 250,000 casualties at Tannenberg and later at the Masurian Lakes did not seem to have a huge impact. Hence, the Russians shortly after invaded East Prussia for a second time. The German victories in the summer and the early autumn of 1914 did not have a decisive or lasting result. Thank you very much for your attention. It's a long way to the It's a long way to go. It's a long way to the To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly.